progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to this study, from the word of God, let us seek his blessing. Let us seek to see what we can understand about these verses and about this section that will apply to our time so that we may more fully understand the task that is yet to come before us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, the land is yet groaning. The animals are groaning. We have not seen the enormity of our sin. We are only now becoming to understand the sin in our lives that have separated us from you. We come before you, Father, beginning to understand our need of your great mercy. Help us now, guide us now, so that we might more clearly understand that of what has happened before, so that we may also understand the task that you would place before us. We know that we can achieve this task through your strength. We cannot do this through our own strength. Direct us now, Father. Help us each one. May your will be done in the manner which most gives glory to your character. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now as we return to this, Judges 2.19, as we were addressing yesterday, we are looking at this to see if we have an application with 2019. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following after other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Does this typify what occurred with Parminder and Tess in Germany in 2019? Mm-hmm. Now, they were very vocal that Jeff was dead, <clears throat> that they wanted to set aside what Elder Jeff had done. Now, I had asked yesterday, um, since there were some, some comments about some of this, that these comments be fully explored. One of the comments that's now in the chat is that we should compare 1 Samuel 3.19 as a contrast to Judges 2.19. So could you please read 1 Samuel 3.19? Let's look at this contrast. Yeah, it was the expression about not letting anything fall to the ground that came into my mind and says, and Samuel told him every whit, so he's talking to Eli, and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is, oh, that's 18, sorry. Yeah, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. And then it's, and 19 says, and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let, did let none of his words fall to the ground. And there's a reading that says, heard him when he prayed. Okay. Okay. 
So instead of being stubborn and being opposed to what God is doing or trying to do in one's life, Samuel was very open to, to receive what God was showing him, even though he didn't enjoy tell, telling Eli that he was going to be destroyed along with his house. So we're, we're comparing and contrasting one person against a group. Would that be correct? Certainly. Yes, definitely. Okay. Like even though when the message is hard to bear and you're a child, so to speak, or maybe actually a child, you should be receptive to what God is trying to share with you. You should be consecrating your life to him. Bear with me for just a second. <clears throat> First Samuel 3.20, it kind of catches me too, because it says that all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Now the, <clears throat> the alternate reading on that verse, on First Samuel 3.20, instead of established, would replace established with faithful. Yeah, I have ordained in, in my, my Bible. So I'll just add faithful in the margin, too. So. In this situation. Those judges, or this judge, as it is presented singularly, when this judge was out of the way, that the people were corrupt more than their fathers. Mm -hmm. Now, I would, I would look at this in a situation that this corruption is shown by the setting aside of the health laws. Um, well, well the, it's, it's actually the, dealing with the word spoiled. Okay. Um, so, so it's, it's related, um, um, like it's a destroyer or a spoiler, uh, to, to cause ruin, right? To cut corrupt, but they're doing this to themselves. Right. So they're in a sense, spoiling themselves now. Right, because it talked earlier, of course, about the spoilers. God sent the spoilers. But now they're going to spoil themselves. Um, so I think that's kind of profound. Yeah, I was talking with an SDA last night, and he told me that he went to church. He's getting more and more estranged from, from these mainline churches. He says there is a female pastor in the pulpit who was pushing spiritual formation and he was looking around to see if people were opposed to it and were going to stand up and I felt like saying well, why didn't you stand up I would have you know but no he said I don't know what's going on at these churches they're becoming so corrupt and I'm saying, I've been telling you that for years but I didn't say that I was going to say yeah, yeah, yeah tell me about this well, I said you know without these studies every day I would go insane. <laughs> I said, this is what my anchor is. 
Yeah. Hearing these reports, it just so disgusts me. It's just... Yeah. Well, I think part of the problem, though, is we have to figure out that we're no different. And that's the thing that's difficult, I think. It's easy to see the problems that exist within the church, within other people. But that's not really going to save us or help us in this situation. So. Oh, man. Yeah. But, but you understand what I'm saying? It's just. Yeah, I, they, I they do. I, went and, I know. And, yeah. So, so when we look at this situation, and, and for instance, here is, here's what Parminder said around that time. This is from one of his videos. It was a question and answer video. Uh, Tess and Parminder and Tabo and uh, I think Marco, I can't remember who was all, you know, at the end of their camp meeting, they had this question and answer session. So Parminder said this, praying is not enough. You need to go to someone who will teach you. Then it, the question, says, should we just submit to everything the leaders of the movement say? Until you learn to use the rules, it is probably a wise decision because your other option is to submit to nothing that the leaders of the movement say. Which, of course, is uh, a false dichotomy. It's ludicrous. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's ludicrous. Not even I do go to somebody that will teach me. I go to the Word of God, like Helen White said, let the Word be yeah. your counselor. I, mean, I ask yeah. the Lord, and He convicts me, and sometimes it's, He has to rein me in pretty sharply, but I yeah. try to test everything, you know. Yeah, but the idea that, that 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 this is the only choice is you have to listen to what the the leaders say or nothing at all, of course, is nonsense. It's not logical. But anyways, anyway, he goes on. If you frame the question that you have to accept everything, submit to everything, the opposite is to submit to nothing. If you are going to say that you accept some things and not others, on what basis would you accept or reject things? He says that it can't be upon conviction because conviction is based upon rules and principles. So you are just going through circular arguments. Now he's actually, everything that he's accusing this person of is what Parminder himself is doing. He says, I suggest that we pray to learn how to use the rules. Faith and, work, and works go together. Go to a decent school. Be instructed by good teachers. You will learn to use the rules. When you do that, you will intelligently submit to everything the leaders of the movement say. And of course, that's completely in contradiction of Miller's 14th rule, where, where he talks about uh, the divinity taught in our schools is always founded on some sectarian creed. It may do to take a blank mind and impress it with this kind, but it will always end in bigotry. A free mind will never be satisfied with the views of others. Were I a teacher of youth and divinity, I would first learn their capacity and mind. If these were good, I would make them study the Bible for themselves and send them out free to do the world good. But if they had no mind, I would stamp them with the other's mind, with another's mind, write bigot on their forehead, and send them out as slaves. So, you know, you can see that the logic that Parminder was using goes contrary to the things that he professes to follow. But creating this false dichotomy, this idea that either I submit to the leadership in everything or in nothing, um, and that I must be instructed by good teachers, well, how you decide what a decent school is or what good teachers are, what standard do I have to even make that decision? If I can't know the truth for myself, I can't know the truth. So, so this is what I believe the corruption is about. When it said they have corrupted uh, Yeah, what you just read sounds a lot like the way I was raised by my parents and also when I, when I went, went to the Catholic schools. I mean, it was hellfire and brimstone and eternal hell if you were, were going to depart from all that dogma that was constantly hurled at us, plus all the physical abuse. It was just horrible. Yeah. But, I mean, this corrupting of themselves, it causes all of the things that we saw manifest in, in uh, Germany there. 
between the rejection of dress reform, of health reform, of the spirit of prophecy, of the way that God has led us, the rejecting of July 18th, all these things are because they corrupted themselves. That is, they spoiled or robbed themselves more than their fathers were robbed or spoiled. Because we've done it to ourselves, it's worse than if it's someone that has done it to us. Dwight? Yep. <laughs> what? Why don't you just look at more blankly? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm considering some other points, so. Okay, yeah. Okay. Then we come back to Judges 2.20. Now, for me, this was a, a very pivotal verse, especially in the way we're considering this, because 2.20, 22, however we want to look at this. Restoration. Is a symbol of restoration is right. Mm -hmm. And the angel... And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. Continuing, I will not henceforth drive out any of them, any from before them, of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So, is this por is this portion of Judges two, even with the references to Joshua, is it taking place after the death of Joshua? Well, I'm looking I'm looking at these two verses and saying that yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Because scripture is its own expositor. Mm -hmm. Scripture is revealing that this portion of Judges was taking place after the death of Joshua. So, <clears throat> Judges 2.20 is the antithesis of reunion. Because if, if the Lord is angry, then the people are not seeking to be reunited, to be unified with God. They're seeking to do the exact opposite. They're expressing their disdain for the word of God. Because they're not willing to accept that the word of God can do exactly what God says he will do. So with the second verse, we are still dealing with an antithesis. That because these people have rejected what God would have done, God is not going to drive out the, others, the other nations from before them. God is recognizing that the covenant has been transgressed and that these people don't wish to do what God has stated that they need to do. Yeah, and then we can see that this is 20 and 21 and, and really 22 and 23. This is all about God proving or testing us by allowing us to allowing the enemies, which we could define, I guess, uh, to still be amongst us. He's not going to drive out the nations or the enemies. So he's allowing this to test us at the present time. At this point, what is our greatest enemy? Well, it's self. Right. So, so the enemy that, that God is allowing is God is allowing us to see the consequences of our own characters. Right. And, and this is why 2020, July 18th, 
it was meant as part of this test that we thought that God was going to be judging the United States, you know, with an attack on Nashville. But um, the Hebrew here says, the nostrils of the Lord grew warm against Israel. That's how they express anger. So when you get angry, you know, your face gets warm or hot. And um, um, and Israel here, I mean, in the period of the judges, you don't have northern and southern Israel. But, um, you know, we God was going to give a judgment against northern Israel, the United States, if we would have been faithful, if we had been converted, God could have used us more than he did. And, and events would be different. Of course, those are ifs. But we can see that really his anger is towards us. This movement is just like ancient Israel. God chose it to do a work, and it's been unable or unwilling to do that work except just in fits and starts. So God's purpose is being accomplished, but not in the way that he would really want to accomplish it. And to me, it shows that we have this period of time which God keeps giving us to, to see our true condition. Not to see the condition of the church or see the condition of the world or see the conditions of others in the movement, but to actually see our own spiritual condition. So we need to take it that the anger of the Lord is hot against us. And that we're the ones that have transgressed his covenant. Now, when we apply the three visions that the, most of the prophets had seen. Yeah. We have the calzone, the mare, and the mara. Which of those visions is the one that brings the prophet face to face with his own character? What's well, the looking glass? The Marah. The third vision, the looking glass, the one where we are being forced to look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. What was the response? of the prophets when they are brought to the Marah vision. They're undone. They're totally destroyed. They're devastated. They die. Really. And and what is their reaction? Well, they call upon God. They're they're truly converted. They fall as one dead. Yeah. In the case of Daniel, what happens when he fell as one dead? Well, he was then revived. What, what happened to Daniel at that point? Well, he said when, there was no breath left in him. Yeah, he was breathless. He was un unconscious, like in a trance. Was he not set up? Was he not brought back upon his knees? Mm -hmm. Can you walk when you're on your knees? But not very well. Are you not reliant upon another when you are on your knees? Mm -hmm. In comparing this portion of Judges with the book of Daniel and with the book of Revelation, we are seeing that Daniel and John both walked by faith and were entirely reliant upon God for everything that was going on. Our situation here 
in Judges 2.20 and 2.21 and beyond. Is the antithesis of righteousness by faith because we're being shown people that have not wanted to walk by faith. They have chosen to walk by sight and walk according to their own heart. We are in need of the experience to accept the point that within us, there is no good thing. That was the problem that in 2019 was occurring because mm -hmm. it's, being, it's being stated and shown that there were leaders at that time that felt that there is good within us and that someone else should be teaching us rather than the word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a good teacher, you know, where he talks about decent schools and a good teachers, a good teacher is just somebody like Miller who would just point you to study God's word for yourself. Right. I mean, it doesn't mean that we don't study together. Right. But we don't use the authority of a teacher. The authority lies in God's word. And... And, and there's no point in accepting what somebody tells you to do, even if they're a good person, if you haven't come to that understanding on your own. It wouldn't benefit you. It'd actually be detrimental. And so Parminder was asking people to do something that was spiritually destructive. And people listened to him. It's totally contrary to God's word. But we really aren't that different. You know, the declaration of December 6, 2020 was no different than what Parminder did. There was no difference from uh, Parminder and Tess and the, the others. Uh, excommunicating Stephen and Odilio on August 29th, 2019, then the declaration of December uh, 6th, 2020. They're really the same, the same thing. It's in the same vein. Yeah. It's in the same character. Mm -hmm. There is nothing different. Yeah. So when we're dealing with these verses, when we're dealing with these examples, we're seeing that there is not the spirit that seeks God, we are seeing that this is a spirit that seeks everything but God. Mm -hmm. As we look at this again at Judges 2.20, We're given reference right back to Judges 2.14. Mm -hmm. That the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. David understood that it was better for him to rely upon the mercy of God than to ever fall into the hands of his enemies.
Why have we had such a hard time understanding this? Why have we had such a hard time accepting this? Well, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. One of the things that I, I came to appreciate with Elder Jeff over the years, when he would give a lesson, he would tell people, do not take my word for it. Study this for yourself. What were we being shown in 2019? The opposite. Exactly. Throughout everything that we are studying right now, the admonition will remain. Do not take my word for it. Do not take Theodore's word for it. Do not take Stephen's word for it. Study this for yourself. Make the decision to make this your own. But that does require effort. Joshua 23, 16. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourself to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and he shall, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. This proving and testing time is never very pleasant. We can compare this to the fire of affliction or the fire on the plain of Dura in the oven that was heated seven times more than it want to be. The net effect of that fire was that you had three that were thrown into the fire. You had others that excelled in strength that were killed because of the fire. Three were thrown in. Three walked out. Yet in the fire, there was a fourth that the king recognized as looking as the son of God. We are not in a fire <clears throat> by our own choice. We are never tested by our own choice. When God chooses to test an individual or a group, he wants to see, are they going to have faith in my word? Are they going to take this word just as it reads? Are they going to make it their own? What are we doing today, brothers and sisters? Are we taking this word and making it our own? What are we choosing to do? Now, These final two verses that deal with verse 22 and 23 that we've applied as being relative to 2022 and 2023. That through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord 
left those nations or suffered those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Why is it in the Hebrew that we can have an example that refers to the death of Joshua and then a couple of verses later refers to the time of Joshua? What is it about this structure that we are being shown? It's a chiastic structure. Well, is it also not that we are being referred to the light that is behind us? Mm -hmm. How are we to walk along the path? When you walk along, when, when you're driving or walking along a path and it's dark and there is a light that comes before you, what's, what do we find? You can't see the path. But when we have light that is behind us, uh -huh. Are we yet able to see that path? Yep. Our safety, brothers and sisters, as we are shown by scripture, is to continue upon the path with the light that was given before us, that is behind us, so that we may understand where we are to walk and walk securely. So my question becomes for 2022, are we going to be willing to accept to being proved by God? Are we going to learn and accept his covenant and walk according to the covenant? So if this is the case, are we not directly in a testing time? Mm -hmm. and, and we should have known that we've been in a testing time. And we, when we, we knew 2020 was a test. Jeff laid it out as a test. It was Abraham offering up Isaac. And it was also Jonah having to go to preach to Nineveh. Well, but it, in the aftermath of that, you know, that test doesn't disappear. It's continuing. But as was being brought out at the beginning of the study, was this not a testing time for Samuel with Eli? Mm hmm At this time in Earth's history, what are we to be like? Are we not to be like little children? Mm -hmm. Samuel was but a child. Samuel was the one that God approached. Eli recognized this. Can you imagine how Eli felt at his age when you have but a child coming to you that has been blessed with the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord has not come unto you, the leader of the church. It 
So Samuel was in a test. Moses had been tested. All of these went through a test and had to prove themselves that they were willing to endure the test to understand what God would have them to do. <laughs> Is that not where we find the movement today? Is that not where we find ourselves today? So, this in mind, we will go back briefly. We were beginning to address this yesterday, but we were also, as you had, as you had been doing, Theodore, you went into this the second sheet. Uh -huh. Because the, the purpose was to look at this in a manner so that we could begin to understand the premise of Rome establishing the vision. Now, according to historians, Rome was established in 753 BC. Within 30 years, Israel was taken by Assyria. Is this important for us to reference? Is this a number that we should be paying attention with? Does it have some kind of import for the movement today? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what does this symbolize for us? Well, we're marking here the, the start, so the end is illustrated by the beginning. And that 30 years, we, of course, compare to the 30 years, 1989 to 2019. And we already had the illustration um, of the death of the papacy on August 29th, um, 1799, and that... Uh, 220 years later, this, this was restored when Stephen and Odilio stood before the papal tribunal uh, to be excommunicated. That was the revival of the papal spirit within this movement. But we can also go back to the founding of Rome and see that there's a 30 years involved just as you have from 1989 to 2019. So 2019 is marked by the 220 and the 30. Um, so, so we have here at the start, you know, God's people are going to be taken captive by Assyria at the time, 30 years after the founding of Rome. So um, I don't know how to explain that connection completely, but, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Here this is, is pagan Rome. But we also have 30 years connected with the time of Christ that's also connected with, with pagan Rome. Right. So, so you have all these periods of 30 years, you have, and, and you have the... You put the 30 years in there with uh, the Battle of Thermopylae, 
Roman Greece and, and the Roman League. So you have that 30 years there. So, so these are all illustrating something that's similar, maybe different aspects of it, because you have the 30 years also uh, with Joseph. Right. 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 So he's going to be 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh, which is Egypt, a different symbol. You know, you have Assyria, you have Rome, you have uh, Rome in its different phases, you have modern Rome. They all have these 30-year periods attached to them. But they're, they're illustrating something for God's people. Right. Now, it's intriguing to me. Uh, address this. I don't have it available on, on this screen at this moment, but I'm going to address it. And I'm going to offer this for your consideration. From the chart, we are well aware that the 1843 chart uses the number of 607 BC, right? We're talking about 677, where Manasseh is taken captive. 607 is where Daniel and his friends, the princes of Judah, are taken to Babylon. And it is in 538 that Babylon is overthrown. Right? Mm -hmm. So the fall of Babylon occurs because Media Persia is overthrowing Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. The fall of Babylon occurs 215 years after the founding of Rome. Is 215 a significant number within this movement? I mean, we could we could use it as the 21st day of the fifth month. It could be 215 in some other iteration. Is it important within the movement? I, I've never used 215 as a symbol. Okay. Now, I find it interesting well, William Miller's birthday and Pope Pius VI taken captive, according to Angela. So, okay. One of the things on which I stood corrected yesterday had to do with the first battle of Thermopylae that took place in about 480 BC. Now, when we're looking at this, we have a date that has been affixed by a modern historian that this first battle of Thermopylae between Media Persia and Greece would have taken place between the 21st and 23rd of July of the year 480. An older historian looked to place this as between the 8th and the 10th of September, also at 480. Yeah, there's differences of opinion regarding this. Um, but one thing we know is in, in the book of Esther, when they have that feast, right. Xerxes feast, and it's just something I noticed. So remember, there's this 187 days divided right. as uh, 180 and 7. And that's in the year 483 BC. Okay. 483 is the number of years uh, for the first 69 weeks of the 70 weeks. So it's just a, a note there. Okay. Uh, but you're going to have 480. That's going to be 
the Persian campaign against Greece happens in 480. So yeah, there's a disagreement whether it's July 21st, 22nd, 23rd, or whether it's in September. Um, and I can't remember the arguments. I used to know that why the differences of opinion occurred. How many years did this Battle of Thermopylae take place after the fall of Babylon? Well, you have the fall of Babylon in 539. So you would just, it's like 59 years. Well, I think if on, I'm doing on, the, on the chart, where do they place this? Well, 538. They place it on 538. Okay. So Eight years. If you were, if you were just ordinarily counting this, and you were going from 538 to 480. How many years would that be? Well, it's 58. Okay. Now, 58 is a number. Um, two of its factors would be 2 and 29, right? Yeah, it's 29 times 2. Yeah. And 29 is a, a prime number. Right. Now, the Second Battle of Thermopylae takes place 191 to 190 BC. And how we would look at the calendar. I find it interesting that that Second Battle of Thermopylae, where Rome defeats Greece takes place about 290 years after the first battle of Thermopylae. Yeah, 289 years. What number of prime is 29? Um, yeah, I know it's a prime number, 289, but... Uh... Okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, it's actually not a prime number. It's 17 times 17. 29 is? 289 is. 289. Well, you want to know what, when 29 is, what prime number it is? Yes, I'm asking what 29 is, is a prime number. It's the 10th prime number. Okay. And... So we have we have a year that is the tenth prime, the number of judgment coming against Greece after this first battle of Thermopylae in the second battle. Now we walk this through because Israel is taken captive by Assyria in 723. Now we come down here to 191. We have Thermopylae, the second battle of Thermopylae, Rome versus Greece. And 30 years later, Rome enters into league with the Jews. The Jews seek to do something that God has forbidden them from doing. Is this not setting aside God's covenant? Is this not the final time that the Jews are setting up themselves as being worthy of entering into a covenant with the heathen lands around them? So 
So you have this period of 30 years. Then you have a period of three years from 161 to 158. Because this covenant then is to be accepted. Whether it's, I mean, it, it's being agreed to in Rome and then three years later agreed to in Jerusalem. It has to be accepted. Then we come down to 4 BC. And we're talking here 187 years after the battle of the second battle of Thermopylae and Christ is born. For 30 years, he labors to be prepared for his ministry. In 27 AD, he's baptized. Elder Jeff and others made the point that Future for America was founded in 1989. And by 2019, it had passed its 30th year. It's preparation time. Well, it wasn't actually founded in 1989. Okay. Because that's going to be 1997, I think, that it's actually founded. But, but that's when Jeff first started studying the the, the repeat Prophetic of history. Mission. Okay. Yeah. So hadn't formally been formed, but that's when it's practically began. Is 1989. So he didn't understand the significance of what was happening at the time. He was just simply um, studying this repeat of history. Now, back at that time, I was also studying the repeat of history, but not in the way that Jeff was, because back then you, it was quite common to hear people talking about Ellen White saying uh, that the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. So, so Jeff was hearing these types of messages, but his approach was different. He didn't get caught up in the, the public debate at first. He just began to study and, and try to understand Daniel chapter 11. And, and so, so God led him to the correct answer, where many people were basically um, speculating. So we had to have somebody raised up who was going to, to follow Miller's rules even though he didn't know anything about Miller's rules. He just was led by God to study in the way that he did. But yeah, that marks 1989. So we come in 30 years, we come down to 2019. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're comparing this with the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ, Was he lifted up at the outset of his ministry? Not till the end. In this situation, we have been addressing that there is a three or three and a half year period. And we would be able to look at this of this in relation with this movement. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking today, will 2023 be the lifting up of this movement? Is the movement to follow according to the path that Christ walked, that after he was prepared at the age of 30, 
that his ministry could then begin. So these questions were running through my mind yesterday. Mm -hmm. I look at these situations with the different battles, the different timings where Babylon fell, where Med the Medes and the Persians fell, and where Greece fell. And I look at this in its interrelationship with Rome. We sought the definition that Rome establishes the vision. For this to be proved, we should see multiple symbols throughout world history and from the Bible that will point out that Rome establishes this vision. Miller accepted that from 158 BC, from the year that he saw the League of the Jews to 508 AD, that this was symbolically the 666 that we find within the book of Revelation. But we have also different periods of time. When we come to 537 AD, where the city of Rome is being attacked and attacked by pagan forces, we're finding that this was being attacked 1,290 years after the founding of Rome. So we wind up with 1,290 that we find in Daniel 12 being tied right back to Rome. Six 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 is a number that we have established as being the number of the Antichrist. Miller would establish that as Antichrist and Rome. 1290 within the Adventist church has been classically applied as being a number that should be tied to 508. But from history, we can also tie it to 537 and 538. Because we have a battle here to overthrow Rome in 537, but in 538, we find that it is not overthrown, it becomes lifted up. Any comments or questions so far? I had um, noticed that with Darius, uh, it says that he's 62 years old when he becomes king. And that's in the, I marked that as 539. Okay. When he becomes king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's 62 years, and then you have 62 years from the fall of the Western Roman Empire and, and 476 until 538. And on each occasion, uh, with, uh, with each occasion, you can note a 126 or a 1260. So from 538 to 1798, you had 1260 years. 
And then in, in, uh, in 539 or 538, we have a many, many tekel you force in there. So we understand that being 126 shekels. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So it ties it ties the the fall of Babylon with the with um, the 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 twelve hundred and sixty years by that connection of that sixty two years. Yes. Yeah. Well, exactly. maybe maybe you could maybe you could tie in the number sixty two. I, I tried to look at it maybe with the sixty two weeks and so forth there. So you, it is a symbol. That, uh, has all the occurrences there in the Bible. So, yeah, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen anything, anything there that uh, can relate to it, that can tie into that. So in the, in the basis of this, does this help us understand how Rome establishes the vision? Well, yeah, it's one of the ways in which Rome establishes the vision. But but there's another thing. Um, so now where do we first get this Rome establishes the vision? What What is the, the verse that we use? In Daniel, Daniel, Daniel so, 11, 14. Yeah, so Daniel 11, 14. Okay. And so... And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now, the vision here is the Kazone vision, correct? I would believe so. Right. And, and I understand that to be the 2520 for northern Israel. Okay. Right. So now Miller never quite put this all together because he's going to have this 666 years connected to Rome that's going to go to 508, right, from 158 BC. And and yet we know that um, and this and, and when does when does this actually happen? Daniel 11:14. What's the event that we use that? Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. What's, what's I, thought it was, I, I thought it was being tied in with their league with Jerusalem. Okay. So, yeah. I think it's pan Panium. Uh, yeah, I think it's Panium. That's what I thought. Now, now how does it happen historically, Stephen? Uh, there was a um, victory initially, Raphia, for the king of the uh, south, over the king of the north. And then when he died, that particular king, to Ptolemy, whatever, um, there so, was uh, the heir to, the heir, yeah, yeah, the heir to the throne was like a child, maybe five years old, or so forth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there was something going on there that the king of the north had means, had desires then to then come back and defeat the king of the south. And um, Rome then stepped in to be like a, a guarantor for the king of the south. Yeah. But at the Battle of the Panium, obviously, it, it didn't really help them. It didn't help the king of the south win or anything. So. I think no. they sent some generals, they, they sent some help, whatever, but it wasn't really sufficient to prevent the King of the North uh, winning. But it, I think it did sort of make them think a bit about what they were doing. Maybe it didn't enable them to go right into Egypt and destroy it, whatever. So maybe like a, maybe hindered them to some level. Okay. Oh, so Okay, go on, Dwight. Okay. <clears throat> when we're reading this with Daniel eleven fourteen, 
the alternate reading from the Hebrew would be as thus. And in those times shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the children of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, but they shall fall. Yeah, so the vision, they don't put that in there, but it's the, the vision. Do they put that in or what do they? No, no, that's. Right, that. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So my question is here. The alternate reading is children of the robbers of thy people. I think we can make the case that the robbers of thy people are Rome. Yeah. But does the alternate reading with the children of the robbers of thy people have import for us today? Well, you can call it the daughters of Babylon. Right. Have you look at it. But it's it's the inheritance that's been passed on down that um, that's being referred to here. Um, well, I, I guess my point, though, I want to go back to the point that I was bringing out. So, sure. Um, so we know that uh, Rome establishes the vision, and and they do so. That is, they exalt themselves. That is, this type, word of exalt. There's different words that are exalt. Uh, this one's not like um, a gadol, right? It's not that type of exalting. Um, it just means that they basically come forth, um, right? Because this is reflexive. They shall exalt themselves. Otherwise, you know, you exalt something, you you bring it forth. But they're going to come forth. And um, this is, I mean, there's so many different meanings to this, of, of how to understand this, but it just means to lift, literally or figuratively. So what, what happens is Rome comes into the picture early on, but their, their role actually comes later on. Yeah, so there, this is in the Hithpal form, so to exalt oneself or lift oneself up. So they're going to, um, I mean, what is it exactly that they're doing, that, that Rome is doing? Is it's trying to support um, the king of the south. But this establishes the vision. Right. And the question is exactly how. It says, but they, they shall fall, right? So they don't they don't succeed in what they're trying to do. And, and we see this happening with the papacy um, in the 1980s. They, in a sense, exalt themselves to establish the vision. But they, they, but they come early. That is, their role is later. So this exalting of themselves is something that just happens um, as a result of what's happening. So uh, to try to apply this to our movement, how would we apply this then if we're going to take, what are we, what are we going to take as the parallel to the children of the robbers of thy people? I would have to ask if we're not seeing the children of the robbers being the lifting up of the Protestants. Okay. Or at least the Protestant method of study. Correct. The Protestant, there you go. The, pro the, the, the apostate method of study. Right. So this is, this is 2019. Okay, but I'm also, you know, I'm looking over a couple of things that, that were posted in the chat, and thank you. I mean, 
the comment here that Stephen made that the Soviet Union was to leave Afghanistan February 15th of 1989, which is another representation of 215. Angela posted that Solomon was 58 at his death. So here again, we have the wisest man that showed how unwise he really was by turning away from God. And he dies at 58. And then looking at the, the comments again from, from both you and from Stephen, 289 multiplied by 360 is 10,000 or 104,040. So 104040. Zero, zero, zero. And asking if this is not another representation of the 104, of 144. And you pointed out that the octal of 289 is 441. Right, the reverse of 144. Right. So all of these numerical representations can be tied right back into this situation with the robbers of thy people. Can they be tied back in with the children of the robbers of thy people? I would think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the point going back to this again, if we can tie the 1290 as having something to do with Rome, as being a symbol of things going on within Rome, and we can tie the 1260 in a similar manner. And as we're looking at this with 30, are we not being given evidences here that Rome establishes the vision? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason to enter into this conversation and the reason to look at it from history Within the Adventist church, have they ever looked to provide a second witness to this portion of Daniel that speaks of the 1,290 days? Are we not told that by the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established? We don't find the 1290 mentioned in other prophetic books in the Bible. Yet we can look at this from history. The validity of the 1290, just like the validity of the 1335, just like the validity of the 2520, can be well established when we are willing to study as Father Miller did. Any other comments? Well, I mean, there are some other points, uh, um, but rather involved. Um, and then they, they involve the, the 2030 date. Right. So I don't know if I, I'll probably leave those for when we, we deal with that then. Um, I guess the, the major point here is 
if we're going to be looking at the movement as being complete or of age by 2019, Well, there's three years okay. that we have sort of to enter into covenant or whatever. Because Christ confirms the covenant with many for one week. So you have the first three years. You do have another period of three years after that. Right. Three and a half years in both cases. So after this, after this three and a half years, 2019 to 2023, will the movement be being prepared to be lifted up in 2023? If it works according, if all this goes according to this pattern that we're trying to establish. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends what you mean by lifted up. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to take on its, the movement at some point has to take on the role that was given to it. It has to complete the task that, that was started by Jeff. Okay. You know, Miller started to work, um, in 1850, they're going to begin this work. Um, you know, the publication of the, the present truth, um, you know, in, in, in all kinds of opposition, all kinds of internal turmoil within the movement. And, and we can see that, we, that we're in that situation and it's not, there isn't going to be any safety in following anyone. It's going to be merely, are we going to individually be converted? Are we going to individually study God's word so that we can be united with Christ so that he can use us, that he can organize us through his spirit to do the things that we're supposed to be doing. And, and we always avoid Christ's method of how he wants to do things because it doesn't appeal to our human nature. It doesn't appeal to our view of ourselves, of our pride, of our view of others, because we think of ourselves as better than others. You know, we're the ones who know the things. We're the ones who people should be listening to or whatever we think. And, and that's never going to accomplish the work. The disciples had to be converted. So however this, however this looks, you know, as far as when, we just know we still have this period of time. And, and this period of time has been given to us partly by Colin in the sense he has made this prediction that's time sensitive and he wouldn't call it a prediction. But many people are going to have to make a choice by 2023 what direction they're going to go. Because when things don't pan out the way um, you know, they're painted to be, then people are going to have to make a choice where we, we, we sort of cause this ourselves. I mean, when you said it, not that we did it because God obviously led, but when you had a date like November 9th, 2019, um, it's going to be a day of decision. There's going to be uh, a division that occurs in the movement, but all we have seen so far is God has been whittling down his people and we can't continue to whittle them down. At some point, God's people have to be converted, be connected with Christ. So, you know, you talk about the Battle of Thermopylae. Of course, the first one is where they have the 300. But we know that that 300 is connected in symbol to the 300 of Gideon. But 300 is also connected to 30. Correct. Yes, correct. As a symbol. And, you know, this movement expected that, you know, July 18th was going to be this lifting up of 
the, the movement. But the lifting up of the movement is just a cross because the lifting up of Christ is, I mean, in some ways it's, it's his glory because, you know, it's the cross of Christ, but it's also a cross still. And people don't want the cross. We don't want the cross. We'd rather have the cup pass from us. Yeah. But if we're Christians, if we're like Christ, we know that, that the cross is an inevitability one way or the other. We have to die. And it's it better to have self die now right. than to see self dying at the end of the thousand years. Right. Only. It's better to die in Christ than to just die in our own sins. Well, isn't that also the point that David made that he would rather fall into the hands of God than fall into the hands of man? Yeah. So is that not the symbol that we should be looking at? Mm -hmm. um, we know the difficulty because, you know, we're human beings and we know how, how long we have avoided addressing the things in ourselves. But God keeps giving us this light and this light is meant to aid us. Right. So we're coming to the close of today's study. In the moments we have remaining, are there any other comments, thoughts at all from what we have covered today? Well, I do know I'm going to use some of this in my studies that I'm doing on 2030. Great. So, so we got uh, Friday night, like tomorrow night, I'm going to be basically reviewing what we did, uh, that sort of introduction to 2030. Um, and then uh, the plan is on Sabbath afternoon at two o'clock my time uh, to do another presentation on 2030. So we have one on Sabbath and one on Fridays, which kind of breaks it up a little bit. You know, some people will be able to see the, it would be nice to get a bit more people involved on, and I think Sabbath afternoon is probably better than Friday evening, especially at this time of year. But um, yeah, so some of these things we will address. Not, not necessarily right away, but as time goes on in these studies. Sure. Okay. Now, are we sort of in agreement with the, I mean, we didn't get a lot of word back uh, on that, but just what we did with Judges chapter two, um, you know, maybe we're taking it too strictly. You know, we can't match every year up with every verse, but we can definitely see that there is that progression from 9-11 to you know, 2023. I, I would think that if we were taking a look, and I, I'm going to have to do this myself. I do have a, a whole group of, of the videos at the time that they were released. So they're, they're all date stamped from basically from 2010 forward. So... I'm going to see what I can do to get my external drives hooked back up and then go back into those videos to see when some of these things were released and then compare this against judges too. Okay. But I think, I, I think the premise is correct. Okay. I think that what's happening here with judges too 
it's laying the groundwork for us on righteousness by faith, but it's also showing exactly in 23 verses, a history of the movement itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether you can match them up year for year, I don't think is really the point as much as that we can see. Overall, it's, it's showing that history. Right. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, a couple of days ago, I would mentioned about uh, <clears throat> Judges 2.13, and I was talking about the union of church and state and male and female, and I was talking, I think I mentioned something about gays, the gays, because uh, the Supreme Court passed, like they were allowing gay, gay marriage and said that it was okay, it was lawful or legal as of uh, the 26th of June in 2015. So I can't, I can't recall ex exactly what I put in chat. And then you, Dwight, had said, well, we'll take this up, up, up tomorrow, but we didn't. So I was wondering what there in that would have had. I mean, it's coming through the church. This is gay rights. This wokeism has really come into the mainline church. And of course, it came into the movement, too, with Tess et al. Uh, so that would have impacted us somewhat. But it, you know, at the outset of the move, at, at the outset of today's meeting, I thought I was giving you the opportunity to be able to cover some of that from what you had addressed yesterday. Oh, oh I guess I missed it. Okay, so I will repeat this. At the outset of Sunday's meeting, if you would please be prepared to address this in detail. All right? Okay. Okay, anyone else? Any other comments? No. Okay, shall we close with prayer then? Gracious Father, we thank you for these examples. We thank you for these points because there is in, in no manner can this be happenstance. In no manner can this be chance. Your hand has directed the events of history and has directed and protected your word through these many years. Help us today, Father, that our minds may be open. Direct us in all that you would have us to do. Show us that that we need to understand for the time in which we now live. I thank you for each one that attended today's meeting. Be with us now as we go about that which you would put before us today. Help us in this way. Guide us. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.